Hello and welcome to the Imaging Wire show. My name is Brian Casey, Managing Editor of the Imaging Wire. Got a great episode for you today. Our guest is Dave Wilson. He is Vice President of Marketing and Communications at Enlytic. And we're going to be talking about the just concluded RSNA 2023 conference. Dave, thanks for being with us today. Oh, glad to be here, Brian. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about Enlytic? Yep. So I, I head up the marketing team here at Enlytic. Uh, we're a small company of about 50 people that's really focused on data management and leveraging AI to do that. So we're looking at how can we standardize and anonymize data for medical imaging uh, with the intent at the end of the day to build a real world evidence database that will allow our customers to find new revenue streams and generate some revenue from from those decades of archives that are locked up. All right. Very good. So we're now into what I think is our third RSNA after the, the COVID postponement. Uh, and, it, and it seems like things are getting back to normal. And, and just being there in McCormick Place, uh, it, it seemed like, you know, things were crowded. The lines at Starbucks were really long. You know, there was a lot of people. Uh, what were your impressions of the meeting? It definitely felt a little busier. Um, I think the impact of COVID is still there. I mean, McDonald's was closed. That's a first, right? Ooh, yeah. Uh, um, and, uh, but I, I could see just from the halls that, that there seemed to be more people. Um, the buses seemed a little busier at the end of the day. And we certainly had a lot more traffic uh, to the booth as well. So it's it's definitely picking up. But yeah, it's still not back to pre-COVID levels, but uh, but slowly growing. Yeah, I think that they said, uh, they said that, that attendance was up 11% over the year before. And uh, that's great, um, but it's still down quite a bit compared to those, you know, glory years when they were getting like, you know, 55,000 people yeah. in McCormick. I think uh, the virtual might have had some impact on that. I don't know what the virtual numbers were, but maybe more people are, are staying home for the education piece. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was watching some of those uh, and it's just, it's incredible that you can just get everything online um, yeah. now. So yeah, I, I think our- The traffic and, you know, other than giving up the- uh, Black Friday shopping, uh, you have the comfort of your own. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, it seemed like AI dominated the the technical exhibits and the scientific sessions, the presentations too. Uh, is that kind of what you thought? Yeah, we've seen a lot of that. I think there was a bit of a shift uh, more towards operationalizing the AI, recognizing that there's challenges with the AI. Um, certainly, we felt like our message around hey, if you're going to have an AI strategy, where do you start? You've got to start looking at the data. You know, it's so data intense to get these algorithms that are, are point solutions up and running that you really need to have better data quality, have the right valid data for those things. And so just recognizing that um, is interesting. Paul Chang was, was interviewed and he made a comment about how we've tried to put AI into a very immature IT environment. And that fits along with what we're trying to do is solve some of those early challenges that if you if you standardize that data, then a lot of the downstream impact is is relieved from that. Um, there was a few white papers as well that we saw come out that were more supportive of the claims. That's always been sort of a challenge on the AI front: is hey, we make this claim, but we have no real clinical proof to back it up. So there's a couple of good papers that that are supporting those claims now, but still a far cry from everybody being able to to do that. Still lots of proof of concepts uh, uh, way so. So in the, in the conversations that you had with people coming by the booth, what were people asking about? What 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 seemed to be like common themes in, in terms of what the clinicians are looking for and, and what they want to know? Yeah. So so since we kind of take a different approach to, let's call it AI, you know, we leverage AI to look at the images and analyze the images and then infer upon that certain data to, to standardize and anonymize the data. We were starting to get a lot of attention in that respect um, as to that whole operationalizing piece. But then we also were getting a lot of attention around the data monetization piece. So, you know, hospitals post-COVID are still struggling to find revenue streams and, and build their revenues up. Imaging's at an unprecedented level of demand. Uh, how do they find a way to leverage that? And so, you know, we've kind of moved our story along that line of let's build a real world evidence database. A lot of pharmas, medical device companies are looking for that. And so people were coming to the booth asking about our approach to data monetization and how can we help them in that respect. 
lot of people want to do it. A lot of people don't know how to do it or what that looks like. There's certainly a lot of concerns around the ethics, the morality, that even the privacy and security aspects of that. But um, that started to resonate more and more, and we started to see more and more customers start to investigate that. You know, years the last couple of years, with the focus on standardization, was really getting people just to be aware of what it is. And I think we saw a little bit of a shift where people are not. There's still a need for education, but they're starting to understand that's the starting point. How do I, what do I do with it once I've got that? So it was definitely a growing area for us. So the issue you're attacking, and, and I, I remember this from some of the, from the previous Imaging Wire show that we did, uh, is that, uh, you know, medical imaging is producing data that has all these different sort of meta tags that are all different, you know, and, and so a CT scan acquired on one scanner might have a different uh description or a file name from one acquired at a different scanner in the same institution. And so that makes it really hard for a facility to, if, if someone comes in and says, well, give us all your CT data, uh, it, you know, of course, anonymized and de-identified, but they can't, it's hard for them to do it because they've got all these, these file names that are all different. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the premise of what we do. So we, we look at the image and we look at the gross anatomy and we look at the pixel data and the metadata. And then we put this inference engine, think of it as a logic layer that says, okay, if we're going to use it for hanging protocols, then we infer from the analysis of the image data, what is the study in series description? And so we will normalize that so that, as you say, when you call up the CT head with contrast, you call up all the studies with the CT head with contrast. And that impacts both the, the current and the prior exam. So now the radiologist hanging protocols work. Likewise, that different in inference engine will sit on that data and say, if we're going to anonymize it, well, in the pixel data, there's a patient name burned into the image. There's metadata. There's maybe military ID has something in there. And so we will then infer that those things either get deleted or pseudo anonymized or whatever the mechanism is to protect the data it might be billing and coding. But again, we're using these different inference engines. And this is where the AI component comes in to take that data and make sure that it's it's anonymized, that it's protected, that it's standardized in a way that can be used. And then downstream, that has an impact. It makes it for the referring physician to be able to understand what they're looking at. It makes it for the researchers to be able to pull up that cohort of the 42-year-old female patient with a positive lung nodule. I want to see all of the patients that fit that criteria. And that's where these sites can then take their decades of archives and start to anonymize that and leverage that for real world evidence and, and data monetization. And, and keep in mind, data monetization could be internal or it could be external. You can use it internally for your own purposes, but at the same time, you can resell that data and, and utilize it for other other purposes like population health and, and that type of thing. So, so when you talk about data monetization, who are some of the folks, the external folks that might be uh, uh, might want this data? Are we talking about like AI algorithm developers, pharmaceutical companies doing clinical trials. I mean, who who wants to who wants this data? You've got you've got the AI algorithm companies because we know validating algorithms is really tough. So how do you get that data? That's you know once it's standardized, then you can find all the right series that you want to run through to validate your algorithm. So there's a big drive for that. The pharma's are moving more and more to real world evidence, not so much a clinical trial where you say let's test these people in this specific cohort, but let's see more of the general population and what has happened. And medical device manufacturers, you know, really anybody that wants to do any kind of research, um, population health research, insurance uh, companies are looking for some of that data to make some some uh, assumptions about or analysis of. Um, there's quite actually quite a large variety of, of organizations that are looking for that data. And so you, as you mentioned earlier, th these are like entirely new revenue streams for hospitals that don't necessarily have anything to do with patient care, but that can, you know, help them out with their, their, you know, financial position. They've got an archive that they're spending money on to maintain and keep running. And for the amount of times they pull that data back and yet it could be making them money paying for itself and then some over time. So, uh, so that's definitely our approach is to help the customers recognize that and, and move them in that direction in a way that they still control the data. So if at any time they want to turn that off, they can. We don't want to duplicate the data. So we're, our devices, our tools are, are going to really have just the metadata, you know, look at the registry of that data and then pull the data back to the, the requesting organization. So it makes it a little easier and, and much more cost effective for facilities to go down that route. 
and then revenue share. So there's really no risk for them. If it gets sold, it gets sold. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But at any time, they can turn it on and off as they want, and uh, and it's a great avenue for them to to make some new new revenue. Now, what were some of the technologies that you were showing uh, in in your booth at RSNA? So, so our our flagship product right now is Index, which is the data standardization tool. So that looks at all of the the aspects of that image and the study, and it normalizes the study description and the series description. Um, so that was our our primary flagship. Uh, we've kind of alluded to, and then MCOG is our data anonymization. So again, using that same analysis of the data and leveraging the AI algorithms, the inference engine looking at that data, finding all of the, the PHI and protecting it in some way, shape, or form that uh, that can then be used downstream into the, that real-world evidence database. And then we highlighted two new products that are works in progress. Uh, ENCODE is a billing application. So again, we take that AI algorithm that has analyzed the data, we put the inference engine on it, and we'll pull data from the coding and say, well, this was a CT head without contrast coded, by looking at the pixel data and the metadata, we know that this was a CT with contrast. We marry the two together and flag it as a discrepancy. And now you've got that output that says, hey, this study was coded incorrectly. You need to correct it before you submit it for billing so that you can get the revenue. And And I believe the stats show that the average hospital loses about $280,000 a year just from underbilling. So, uh, so that's a huge piece. And then on top of that, um, our... Our, what will hopefully be our flagship product down the road is Insight, which is the real world evidence database. That will be collecting all of that metadata that we've spoken about, uh, persisting it in a database that then can be used for research and other other aspects such as that. Now, you recently signed on a couple of new customers for Index. Can you talk about those deals a little bit? Yeah. So Wake Radiology, uh, based out of North Carolina, came on board. Uh, they are in the midst of implementing the software today. They're using it. They've got over 50 radiologists that are very subspecialized. So, you know, when you think about standardizing the data, you've got a doctor that does MSK and one that does neuro and one that does, you know, uh, cardiac and all these specific uh, submodalities or subspecialties. Um, and so they then, when they're routing the data, when they're billing the data, when they're even when they're doing their reporting, the templates that come up, the hanging protocols that come up, because they're bringing data in from multiple sites and, and multiple modalities, so the earlier problem we talked about, the data is not labeled correctly, they're spending time having to find the right template, finding the right hanging protocol, trying to figure out how, wh which study does this apply to. So, you know, it's taking an inordinate amount of their time. And so to gain efficiencies, they apply index to that, that changes the study description and series description. So now those templates come up correctly and they're able to do their reporting much faster. I mean, uh, the radiologist spends two minutes on the images, four minutes on the report. So we now to six minutes, where do you reduce the time? If you can reduce the time on them doing the report aspect, and we can show anywhere between 30 to 90 seconds of that time is spent getting ready, then that's a huge savings on their on their time overall. So uh, so that's Wake. Uh, and then newly, newly announced is our relationship with Infinite. So Infinite... North America is a, is a PAX vendor. They've got a, a wide plethora of uh, products there, PAX, RIS, VNA, the whole thing. And we're going to work with them to integrate index into that so that their data is standardized so that their customers get the same benefits through the hanging protocols, dictation templates, and, and all the rest. So. It seems like the platform companies, the AI platform companies have become really important right now. Is that, that, that seems like that's a key part of your business. A lot of discussion at RSNA this year about platform companies. Uh, everybody's on everything, right? Um, and, you know, it, it does make a lot of sense. We, we're working with Blackford, uh, probably the leader in that, that space. Um, and when you think about all the different algorithm companies that are RSNA, I think there was, there was 247 companies that said they were doing AI in some way, modality vendors, point solution vendors, everything in between. Um, if you are a hospital that's going to take all of these different algorithms and integrate them into your packs, can you imagine the workload to do that? You know, you know, your stroke protocol, your chest protocol, your fracture protocol. I mean, having a platform like Blackford makes a lot of sense because you integrate the platform. The platform then takes all the PACS data, you know, the medical imaging data one time, sends it to the appropriate algorithms. And with us involved in that situation, 
the data is standardized so you can really route the data through the platform correctly to where it needs to go. You don't have to route the entire study. You can just route the series that needs to be analyzed and then spit out the results. And those results have to be integrated back in. So if it's coming in through the platform like Blackford, then again, you're saving a lot of time and energy on the integration because it's Blackford's responsibility to make sure that all these AI companies work. So it's it's a logical approach to something. You know, I go I hearken back to the days of 3D, uh, and it's very similar to that where you had you know a dozen 3D vendors and three workstations in there, and now they're all integrated into the packs. I think you know we we learn from that with uh, with AI. So it's certainly a step forward. Good deal. So what can we expect to see from Analytic in uh, 2024? Ah, well, we got lots of exciting things coming in the new year. Certainly the two products, Zencode and Insight, are going to come to market in the coming months. Uh, we've got some some great new announcements coming up in the new year as well uh, and some exciting growth uh, within the company. So it's going to be, 2024 is going to be a banner year for Analytic. And uh, as we keep growing our presence in the marketplace, I think we'll start to see more and more Analytic sites pop up uh, as we go. So All right. very good. Yeah. We'll, we'll look forward to seeing it. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Dave Wilson of Enlytic for being with us today. Thanks, Dave. Brian, appreciate the time and uh, happy holidays, everybody. I uh, hope you have a great time. You bet. All right. Signing off for the Imaging Wire, my name is Brian Casey.